Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an honor uh, for me to be here today and again to be part of the decennial team and very much a part of this important mission uh, for 2020. Um, Lisa is on uh, business travel uh, today and is sorry to miss the PMR, but she's here in spirit. And so uh, one of the things that she does that I'll do right now is go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, first of all, this is our first uh, half-day format, and we're also in the new, uh, in the auditorium uh, to better accommodate uh, all of the attendees. Um, and in our quest to provide greater access to information about uh, our progress uh, on 2020, uh, we are trying to reach uh, a wider uh, audience of stakeholders. Uh, however, uh, this does require a few important uh, reminders. Uh, the uh, meeting is being broadcast internally on ETV and also externally on the web. Uh, so we need to consider all microphones uh, live at all times uh, when having side, sidebar conversations. We also have uh, legal requirements uh, we need to follow when talking with contractors or potential contractors. Uh, Mike Polensky, uh, chief of our acquisition uh, division, uh, will say a few words. Uh, to remind staff of the legal obligations uh, when speaking with contractors. Uh, Thanks, Sharon. So w it, this is a public meeting. We're being broadcast. Everything we talk about here is public information. So I just ask the sidebar conversations at breaks. There's contractors here. There's government employees here. There's contractors watching us online. They don't have that same advantage being here. So just keep your conversations to what's publicly available if people are asking you questions. So just be careful about what we talk about and not talk outside of that. We're not talking about solutions from them. We're not talking about what about this, what about that. It's really, it's, it's really ask questions. You can answer questions that are publicly available information. The things that we're talking about today are publicly available. So anything we release to the public, we can talk about. But anything that's not released to the public, then we keep quiet about that. Okay, thanks, Mike. Okay, uh, also remember that uh, when you uh, speak uh, directly onto the microphones, uh, to turn on the red button when speaking and then to turn it off when not speaking. Uh, apparently, we, we can only have four mics on at the same time. Uh, restrooms are out here about 50 feet up on the right uh, before you get to the elevators. And then uh, emergency exits are also right here and then uh, down over there. Uh, but uh, in an emergency, we'll uh, uh, try to direct you out of here. So with that, we'll actually get started uh, with our uh, PMR. Oh, one last thing, questions. Uh, uh, Q&A is encouraged, uh, but due to time limitations, uh, we have an email address up there that you can use to uh, uh, send any feedback to us. All right, now we're ready to get started. Uh, so today's agenda, we're going to give you an update on the decennial uh, staffing. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about where we are with the 2020 census program. Uh, we'll also give you an update on the status of the uh, 2020 census operational plan. And then we're going to review the status of the 2015 uh, census testing activities uh, for address validation, optimizing self-response test, and for the 2015 uh, census test. And then uh, we'll end with an update on the 2016 uh, census testing activities. So uh, we're very excited that our reorganization did happen on May 31st, uh, 2015. Uh, even though it happened, we still have quite a bit of work to do. Uh, we're using the next few months to transition the work, even though everyone is operating in their new roles and in their new structures. Uh, we're working to uh, transition the work uh, from the old structure to the new structure. 
Uh, we're also uh, conducting training uh, below the management level uh, on uh, the roles and responsibilities under the new structure. And then uh, lastly, since the last PMR, we've uh, launched a, a team uh, 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 to uh, fill uh, the vacancies that we have uh, quickly and efficiently. Uh, our goal for the decennial census directorate is very much aligned to the 2020 census goal uh, to improve the way we uh, do the work so that we do it uh, with high quality and much uh, more effectively. Uh, in terms of uh, additions to our team, next. Um, we uh, wanted to uh, welcome Deb Stempowski. Uh, I see her in the back. Maybe Deb can just wave her hand. Is she back there? Yes. Uh, Jeb is the new chief of the American Community uh, Survey Office. Um, and we're lucky to have Deb. Uh, Deb previously was chief of our economic uh, management division in the economic programs directorate. Uh, we're also delighted to have uh, Liz Grieco. She's our new senior advisor. She's waving her hand in the back there uh, for administrative records and data linkage. She comes to us from the demographic uh, surveys directorate. Uh, we have a, a great uh, team of uh, senior leaders and office chiefs uh, right here. To my left is Deirdre Bishop, uh, chief of our decennial census management division. Uh, Tim Trainer uh, in the back there, chief of our geography division. Uh, Pat Cantwell, chief of the decennial statistical studies division. You'll be hearing from Pat later. Uh, Deidre Hicks, Chief of our Decennial Program Management Office. She's also in the back there. Uh, Tasha Boone, Acting Chief of the Decennial Communications and Budget Office. And Tasha, I know, is somewhere around here. Uh, we are uh, interviewing and filling uh, positions. Uh, we uh, uh, are close on the Redistricting and Voting Rights Data Office, uh, the Decennial IT Division. Uh, we're interviewing for the Translation Office Chief and uh, Chief of the Decennial Directorate uh, Support Services Office. Uh, and it would be, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we have wonderful staffs uh, supporting uh, uh, and doing all of the work of the office, of the mission of the offices and divisions. Um, and with that, I turn it now to Deirdre Bishop to get us started. Thank you. One of the nice things you can see about Shireen is that she brings a wonderful sense of calm to the picture, and she really <laughs> makes everything look so easy. So she's been a great mentor to me since she's been here. Thank you. Uh, I, I see many familiar faces in the room, and I'm thankful for that. I know it's a busy time. I hope you're all having a nice summer. Um, before I get started, I would like to give a little bit of, re of a refresher in terms of where we are with our 2020 census planning. Chuck, I'm good for the next slide. Thank you. Um, for all but one of our tests that we're conducting this year in fiscal year 15, we're winding down our efforts. We're preparing to baseline our preliminary design decisions related to the 2020 census by the end of this fiscal year, which will include a life cycle cost estimate for the 2020 census reflecting our major design de decisions. This is really the point in the decade where we must make the choices that are going to set our major operations for the census in motion. Our program has spent the past few years doing extensive research, testing, and design. We've spent the better part of this year narrowing down our efforts to leading us to being able to make those preliminary design decisions. You can see on the graphic that soon we're going to be moving from our small scale individual tests to refined individual tests. We're going to be moving from proof of concept and prototype IT systems to the actual building of our IT systems and procedures. Let's talk a little bit about where we are today. I'm not going to go into too many details in the interest of time because we have a lot of speakers and as you heard earlier, we've moved to the half day format uh, based on a lot of feedback that we received from our attendees. Uh, but I am happy to report that we have completed the address validation test. You'll recall that this contained two components, the math model validation test and the address validation test. You'll hear about this from Evan, 
Pat and Mike coming up soon. We've nearly completed all of the operations associated with the optimizing self-response test. That's the test that we conducted in the Savannah, Georgia area. We have one re-interview operation to go there, and you'll hear from, about that test from Jessica, Mike, and Frank. We've nearly completed our efforts related to the 2015 census test in Maricopa County, Arizona, and we have one evaluation follow-up effort to go there. You'll hear about our efforts in relation to that test from Marianne and Tom. I'd just like to take a pause here and thank everyone who supported these tests. We had um, both, uh, both thanks to those here in person and to those watching on ETV. We had many successful partnership and outreach efforts in our Savannah test. We had many people, especially those here in the room, go out to Maricopa County, Arizona and observe our field operations and how we're making significant changes to those. We had members also go out and observe our operations at the uh, Denver Area Operations Support Center in, in terms of how we're uh, operationalizing the management of those field operations. You shared your feedback with us and we really appreciate that. We consider those very good lessons learned and we're applying those to our planning for 16 and the years beyond. Um, I would be remiss also at this point not to say a huge thanks to the people at this table and to the people in this room and out uh, in the Census Bureau building and in the field. Um, they really committed themselves to the success of these tests, so thank you. In June, we received OMB clearance to move forward with the 2015 National Content Test. That means that we're good to go with a September 1st date uh, for that nationwide test of 1.2 million housing units. On June 30th, we announced the locations of our 2016 census test. Uh, if you haven't heard yet, I'm happy to report that we'll be conducting the tests in portions of Los Angeles County, California, and Houston, Texas, and I'll talk about that at the end of our program today. And finally, we've made significant progress in the development of our 2020 census operational plan. As I mentioned earlier, that'll be the preliminary design for the 2020 census, and Anne, as she has at previous PMRs, will share our progress in those activities. Now I'd like to focus on our major innovation areas. These were the cost drivers of the last census and the areas that we've been focusing most of our research on during our research and testing program this decade. As I have in previous PMRs, I'll just share the goal of each of those uh, major innovation areas with you as a reminder and for those that may be new uh, to, the, to the audience and to the program. Our first innovation area is re-engineering address canvassing and the goal here is to reduce the need for a nationwide in-field address canvassing, walking around to every single census block, adding new addresses to our list and making updates to those that have changed. Instead, we plan to use things like aerial imagery, administrative data from our government partners at the state and local level, uh, commercial data from uh, vendors out there who are collecting address and spatial data on a daily basis. We'll be looking at that information instead, conducting a lot of the work that we would have done in the field in the office uh, and doing only a small portion of the work in field address canvassing. So what have we accomplished since the last PMR? We've refined our business process models for in-office address canvassing. We've continued to develop the systems that will be used to support that in-office address canvassing. And we've completed the summary of responses for our change detection re request for information. We talked a little bit about that at our last PMR. Looking ahead, we will issue the address validation test report. I know many of you are anxious to see that. It is complete and it's actually with me for a final review and then we'll be pushing it up our management change. So hold tight, it'll be released soon. Mm -hmm. um, we also plan to complete in the next few months our plan for address canvassing, how we're going to implement that operation in the office, in the field, through our MAP coverage study and our quality assurance operations that accompany that. We'll release the change detection request for proposal will award a contract for national address, geospatial, and imagery data sets. And finally, we'll define our system requirements for the 2016 address canvassing test. Uh, 
the goal of our second innovation area, optimizing self-response, is to communicate the importance of the 2020 census to the United States population and generate the largest possible self-response, including allowing respondents to respond to the census without a unique census ID. This is what we call non-ID processing. We're focused on this area because the more we can reduce the non-response follow-up follow -up workload, the less expensive the census will be. Non-response follow-up is traditionally our most expensive operation that we conduct in association with the decennial census. So what have we accomplished here? In terms of our optimizing self-response test in Savannah, uh, census day was April 1st. We sent the final reminder with paper questionnaire booklets to people between April 7th and April 14th. We sent a postcard invitation to previously non-sampled households. This was a late design change to our program. We wanted to see how people res would respond to, uh, after being exposed to the advertising campaign if they received uh, one postcard invitation. And we did receive a very positive response over 8%. Jessica will talk about a that a little later. We ended official data collection for this part for this test on May 31st, and we closed our data collection systems on June 23rd. That is the internet self-response application. As I mentioned, we are preparing for our 2015 national content test. Uh, we posted the final solicitation for comments in the Federal Register Notice on May 22nd. We received OMB clearance on June 26th. We finalized our paper questionnaire and our other mailing materials. All print materials were sent to our vendor for production. We conducted a forum uh, on ethnic, ethnic groups from the Middle East and North African communities. We had 27 attendees, and over 32 experts commented on our plans. And we completed sample design for this survey. So you can see we're busy uh, in that regard. Looking forward, in relation to the optimizing self-response test, uh, I mentioned earlier that we have one operation to go. That re-interview data collection will begin on July 15th and end on August 7th. And in relation to the national content test, we'll begin the self-response data collection on August 24th, with Census Day being officially on September 1st of this year. The goal of our uh, using administrative records innovation area is to use administrative data such as federal, state, and local government data and third-party data that is from commercial sources to reduce the non-response follow-up workload. The data sources may also be used to enumerate the population in cases of non-response. What have we accomplished over the past few months since our last PMR? In support of the 2015 census test, we received monthly deliveries from the IRS uh, informing us of the federal tax returns. We received data from the United States Postal Service about the undeliverable as addressed housing units that were delivered as part of our 2015 census test. This was in support of the identification of vacant housing units. If we ad identify a housing unit as vacant, we can remove that household from the non-response follow-up workload. We implemented the administrative records identification of occupied housing units, and we completed data collection for the 2015 census test portion non-response follow-up. Looking ahead, we'll continue to baseline our report on admin records used in the 2014 census test. We'll analyze the data collected in 15 and begin our reporting on that. Uh, we're going to present our findings at an upcoming meeting of the joint statistical meetings in August. And um, another addition to the program, we're beginning to work very closely with the states on the acquisition of SNAP, WIC, and TANF data to help us uh, with the administrative records inventory. Our fourth innovation area is re-engineering field operations. Um, this is one of the most significant innovation areas that we're studying as we look toward 2020. The goal here is to use technology to more efficiently and effectively manage the 2020 census field work. How can we replace what humans used to do with technology to help us get our work done better and faster? We've had a lot going on, as you can tell, over the past few months. We deployed an enhanced operational control system to help us manage the caseload of non-response follow-up cases in that Maricopa County test. 
we used automated training instead of in per extensive in-person training and verbatim training to instruct our local supervisors of operations and our enumerators. We conducted interviews with our non-responding households, not using paper and pen like in the old days, but instead using a handheld smartphone with an application to enumerate and conduct the interviews. We monitored our operational progress in real time. We created daily optimized assignments through the use of these control systems. And finally, looking toward the 2016 test, we released a request for information about how we can possibly use device as a service. How can we partner with commercial entities in terms of logistics with our smartphones and uh, the technology we use to manage the census? Um, as I mentioned, looking ahead, we'll begin our data analysis for the 2015 census test. We'll incorporate all the lessons we've learned, not only into the functionality of our systems, our operational control system and the enumeration instrument, but also into the lessons learned. How do you manage your staff? How do you conduct the interviews? We're learning a lot. And again, thank you for those of you that went out and provided feedback. And I would be remiss, this bullet is not on the slide, but beginning now, we're really gonna put a lot of effort into planning and implementing those 2016 tests in Los Angeles and Houston. With that, uh, I would now like to turn it over to Ann Wittenauer to talk about the status of our 2020 Census Operational Plan. Passing of the baton early in the morning. Good morning, as Deirdre said, I'm here to give you a brief update on the status of the 2020 Census Operational Plan which I'm happy to say is on track for release October 1st of this year. Today you're going to hear how we have refined our work, iterating after many rounds of review to provide not only a solid set of documentation, but more importantly, a program baseline that lays the foundation for a successful 2020 census. So let's get started. Next slide, please. Many of you have seen this slide, so I'll very quickly provide some context for today's update on our work for those who are joining for the first time or who might need a refresher. This operational plan, or the first release of it, bridges two critical phases in the 2020 Census life cycle. The formal research and test phase, which ends September 30th of this year, and the operational research and design build phases that commence later this year and bring a rapid uptick in our march towards 2020 census production. Most of the early research and test work culminates this year with the preliminary design decision, which is the centerpiece of our operational plan. The goal, as most of you know, for our preliminary design decision is to conduct the 2020 census at a lower cost per housing unit than the 2010 census when adjusted for inflation while maintaining high quality results. The preliminary design thus will focus on the four key areas of innovation that Deirdre just summarized so nicely for us because they have the potential for the biggest cost savings upwards of $5 billion if they are planned and implemented correctly. Now, with the first version of the 2020 Census Operational Plan coming out um, three years earlier than it did last decade and five years earlier than it did for the 20, or excuse me, the 2000 Census, there are things that we are not going to know when we release this first version of the operational plan. So the documentation in October is going to include design issues, additional operational research, and testing activities that are still needed in order to mature our design for the census over the next few years. And thus, as you would expect, there will be successive releases of the operational plan and related documentation as we learn more. The final version, as a result, will not come out until 2021, and it will document what we actually did to implement the census. So besides laying out the preliminary design decision, 
which we're going to refine through further testing. The other purpose of our documentation and the operational plan is to lay a foundation for the work needed in the rest of the census life cycle. Let's go to the next slide. One last quick refresher. You've heard me say the operational plan is a set of documents. This slide depicts at a high level what I mean by a set. The first bucket of work consists of the concept of operations or CONOPS. It's the core of the operational plan. Within the CONOPS, we're going to describe how we will execute the census, meaning we will include our plans for implementing the preliminary design decision, the four key areas of innovation, and also each of the 34 proposed operational areas that we envision for the 2020 census. And I'll provide a lot more about those operations in the next slide. The second bucket consists of something we call supporting documentation. And this set has been expanding over the past few months. And for example, what I mean by that is initially we were focused almost exclusively, and rightly so, on the revised life cycle cost estimate as a core piece of this documentation. And also the IT architecture, also very critical. More recently, we have decided to include still more documentation, such as a crosswalk for recommendations from many of you in our oversight community. We're also in planning uh, to include a continuity of operations plan, to name just a few. The third bucket that we think of in our set of documentation consists of the communication tools. These things that will be uh, useful for us to convey to our stakeholder community how we're going to implement and conduct the next decennial census. By this, I'm specifically thinking and referring to infographics. And I'm happy to say that we are working on a draft, um, one in particular called the 2020 Census, a new design for the 21st century. And eventually, we'll probably have videos, all of which are designed to help us convey what it is we're doing with the 2020 Census. So that's our set. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, this slide represents the meat of this morning's update in terms of our progress over the last couple months. There are three things that are important about this chart. First, it, shows the, it depicts the current set of operations, and I'm going to tell you in a minute how this has changed since our last uh, PMR. Secondly, this chart depicts the status of each operation, and this is important so that you have an idea of what to expect that is the level of maturity for each operation when our documentation is released in October. And lastly, I'm going to touch upon the alignment of our program and the, uh, 20, and, excuse me, the enterprise work breakdown structure. So di diving deeper, the current list of operations. Well, there are still 34, for those of you who remember the last uh, PMR, but things have evolved as our planning has matured. We've been quite busy with internal review sessions. The word extensive comes to mind, and I'm sure Deirdre and Pat and others would agree, since we've spent the better part of three work weeks in the last couple months, uh, hold up with our subject matter experts and leadership to refine and mature the documentation. We call these sessions lockups, so you know it's very serious. Let me step you through the changes. First, there are still nine support areas, but we've undergone quite a bit of refining here. All of this is reflected in the top row. First, we have a new operational area, systems engineering and integration. And by this, I mean all of the critical work done regarding requirements management, quality management, test management, and so forth. Secondly, you'll see uh, we have merged strategic communications and program management into one support area called program management, which, as you would expect, includes all of the vital functions such as budget management, schedule management, um, governance, and so forth. We've also decided in the third change that legal and policy is better covered within each operational area, so it's no longer considered its own support or operation area. Lastly, in this uh, top row, you'll see that we split field infrastructure into two. Now it's field infrastructure and decennial logistics management. 
the latter of which will enable us to better plan and oversee the work relative to warehousing, kit assembly, inventory management, and so forth. Now, moving on to the other changes. Again, there are 25 operations represented in the bottom two rows. But we did make a change in the res uh, response data section. We have split what was called paper processing into two operations. Now, forms printing and distribution and paper data capture. Another change in the bottom row uh, is reflected by the operation called evaluations and experiments. As a result of our extensive reviews, we have decided to combine what was called 2030 research and planning and evaluations. So with this picture, you get the latest uh, snapshot of the operations and support areas envisioned for the 2020 census. Now, for the second point that I want to convey, uh, the color coding in, in each operation depicts the status Let's talk about that briefly. Notice the legend in the bottom half of this picture where it says detail planning has begun, detail planning is underway, detail planning has not yet started. We've color coded our operations so that you can get a, a visual of what types of information or the level of information and maturity you'll be reading about in October. For 13 of the operations, Detailed planning has either not yet started or has only recently begun. As a result, the operational plan is going to have less information about these areas. The content will be leaner, in other words, and by that I mean our documentation is going to include maybe a handful of things such as the purpose, our lessons learned since the last census, key elements of the operational design, any decisions that have been made to date, design issues that still need to be resolved, and cost and quality impacts. On the other hand, for the remaining 21 operational and support areas, work is underway, as evidenced by the dark green shading. These 21 areas will have significantly more information that we can convey. So besides the purpose and lessons learned, we're going to be calling out innovations since the last 2010, excuse me, since the 2010 census. Uh, cost impacts compared to the 2010 census, key risks, key milestones, to name just a few. Lastly, the third point I want to draw to your attention in looking at this slide. It is subtle, but very important. And this is depicted through the background coloring and we're using that to show our alignment of the 2020 census program with the enterprise work breakdown structure. The enterprise work breakdown structure has eight elements. and We have now organized our work so it is consistent with six areas that, with these six areas, excuse me, that apply to our program. In the top yellow row, you see three of the enterprise uh, work breakdown structure, work, tongue twisted, work breakdown structure elements, program management, census survey engineering, and infrastructure. Similarly, in the middle row, there are three more elements of the enterprise work breakdown structure through which we have categorized our work, frame, response data, and published data. This alignment, as you all know, is fundamental for good program management in order for us to successfully plan, monitor, and control our costs schedule and scope. So, next slide. Back in April, I introduced a new task to you that our team had undertaken, decision analysis and support work. This effort consists of cataloging and prioritizing the decisions and assumptions that our subject matter experts and our leadership have made to date, as well as the decisions that are still needed. This information then gets documented formally and escalated to the, through the appropriate governance process and managed by change control. The work had just commenced when we had our last program management review on April 8th, and I'm happy to share with you today on the next slide that we have made good progress in this work. Next, please. This slide lists the eight operations whose decisions we have reviewed and documented. 
And you'll see that for two of the eight, as I mentioned a minute ago, they have been split into two operations. So at this point, 10 of our 34 operations have been through this analysis process. We've prioritized our work here on the operations that are either early, that are big, or that are informing the requirements needed later this year, for example, for systems development work or for large acquisitions. We're going to continue this work through the rest of the summer using this prioritization I mentioned just a minute ago. Next slide. Quality. You know our challenge. Continue to deliver high quality results with the 2020 census, but contain costs such that they are lower per housing unit when adjusted for inflation than the 2010 census. So another critical component of our work these past few months has been zeroing in on the most appropriate quality metrics. We have rightly focused, excuse me, we have rightly fixed our focus on the key areas of innovation, given that they have the greatest potential for cost savings. And here this morning, I'll very briefly uh, mention a few of the quality metrics that we're uh, proposing. For address canvassing, we're looking at a num the number of ads captured and the number of deletes captured. For self-response, just a couple examples. The projected rates of self-response for the United States and by demographic groups. Also, we're looking at estimated number of correct enumerations. And for the biggie, non-response follow-up, we're looking at the estimates of total for the US by the demographic groups and, and so forth as compared to the 2010 census. We're looking at counts of housing units, both occupied and vacant, and the percent of cases resolved by administrative records or by proxy. Next slide. And lastly, let me briefly talk about the very critical work related to our revised life cycle cost estimate, a key deliverable within the operational plan documentation. As you would expect, we are, in fact, conducting what is tantamount to bottoms-up estimates for each operation. But the point of this slide is to re reiterate the reasoning behind our work this spring with the cost model. We have focused our efforts on what I like to call the big rocks in the jar when it comes to cost savings. The greatest emphasis has been placed on these areas that most likely will account for the majority of our estimated savings, the key areas of innovation, given their combined potential for a savings of just over $5 billion. Next slide. In that vein, we have been working to encourage, excuse me, to ensure linkage between the cost estimates for the operations and the, and the systems that will enable them, and focusing on defining workload parameters by work breakdown structure to inform our cost estimates. Next slide. So, in conclusion, um, and to wrap up this very brief update on the operational plan, we are meeting our internal deadlines. Our documentation has progressed through extensive reviews. We're developing quality metrics and workload parameters, and we are aligning our work to the work breakdown structure. In short, we are on target for the planned release in October of 2015, and in just a few months at our next program management review. It's full steam ahead for the operational plan. Are there any questions? Am I live? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for all this information. Real quick, a couple real high level. I don't see scheduling listed in this kind of operational thing. What, could you, if you could give us just a quick comment on the status of that, particularly as it leads towards doing some sort of a schedule risk analysis at some point. I mean, that's resource loaded and all that kind of stuff. Well, go ahead. Sure. I'll ask a question after. Um, in conjunction with the development of the 34 operations and with the life cycle budget cost estimates, we are working very hard to flesh out the schedule for the 2020 census. We have an integrated master schedule, as we've mentioned before. Um, we are moving toward the enterprise tools that we use to manage our, uh, resource loaded schedules. Um, Ty, I know you receive copies of our schedules on monthly basis. Um, just as I feel the operational plan is moving along nicely, I'm happy with the progress in terms of the life cycle cost estimates of our budget and our schedule as we look toward 2020. 
do you have a, a time frame in mind for when you think it'll be resource loaded? Yes, um, we've worked with our uh, ORMP, the Office of Risk Management and Program Evaluation, mm -hmm. and by the end of this year, we will be resource loaded for uh, a subset of the operations related to the 2020 program. Thank you. <laughs> Look for that when it's coming. A um, uh, couple more, just uh, trying to stay at the high level. On the, on the administrative records, getting this stuff from the states, the SNAP and the TANF in particular, do you have some milestones in place, some targets, so that you have a sense that you're on track, you're making it, you can manage that? As you know, uh, over the past few years, we've been operating with limited resources. We have focused our research related to the use of administrative records uh, more significantly on national level files. Um, with that said, as we approach the operational plan uh, milestone, by the end of this year, we believe we need to know the core set of records that we will use uh, in association with the identification of vacant housing units and the occupied housing units to help with enumeration. Uh, with that said, we're working very closely with CARA, our Center for Administrative Records and Research Application, on the acquisition of these state-level files, and we do have many in-house. Um, as we look toward the census tests, in 2016 in Los Angeles and Houston, we are trying to acquire state level files uh, for those test areas to see how we can apply that, later, that data to our research. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Trisha Durr with the OIG. You mentioned the uh, quality metrics for ADCAN as being number of ads and number of deletes, and is there a goal um, other than just a straight number? I think you'll learn a lot more about this during the presentation from uh, Evan, Pat, and Mike. So Tricia, if you'd be willing to hold that question, I think you'll get your answer very shortly. Yeah, okay. uh -huh. Sure. Okay. I have one more if there's no one else. Uh, just really quick, at, at a high level, you mentioned the governance process, the decision analysis. How would somebody not in the middle of that governance chain, know which of those operations have completed what you described having happened for 10 of the 34? Um, so let me see if this helps. Uh, for each of the operations, we have a team of people who are responsible for carrying out the activities associated with those operations. They have been involved with the development of the operational plan They've contributed to the life cycle cost estimates and to the development of our schedule. Um, we have had many sessions in which the entire management team associated with the decennial census, so not only decennial census management division, but geography division, decennial statistical studies division, um, sometimes members of the IT directorate, and always members of the 2020 census operational plan team hear what's happening in relation to the development of this plan. Um, we then, once we complete uh, each iteration, share that with Shireen, with Lisa, with Nancy, and with John. And Brian, and Brian, and Brian of course, for our IT work. There's some kind of a wrap-up document or something? There's a, a milestone, it's like, okay, now it's stamped, it's done, we know it's on this list, so that folks mm -hmm. outside the Bureau, if they wanted to take a look, you know, I mean, I'm just trying to find how, to, mm -hmm. how, we, how we would know which ones and what we'd, look, what we'd be looking at. Yep, so as we've talked about um, in previous PMRs, and as Ann mentioned today, we are on track to baseline the operational plan uh, by the end of this fiscal year. We started out developing a narrative associated with the operational plan. And very quickly, it became obvious that um, this narrative was going to be over 300 pages. So how were we going to use that as a tool to communicate the information? Um, we decided that in addition to the narrative, we would develop what we call a slide deck library. So for each operation, we will have the lessons that we learned from 2010, the key innovations that we're applying for 2020, the key decisions that we've made to date through our work, uh, not only on the development of the operational plan, but what we've learned from the 2013, 2014, 2015 tests, key decisions that we still have to make, um, the risks 
that we're knowledgeable, you know, that we're planning for. Uh, the cost and quality impacts, and then a schedule, a timeline for what's going to occur next. That will all be included in part of this slide deck library for each operation. And I think that will be more easily shared as we move forward. Very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, real, real quickly. Um, once we get the initial design document and then you move to future iterations, how are you going to document changes in those updates to the, you know, the baseline decisions, the cost, the schedule? Is that going to be a major component of sort of the second, third, fourth, and so on for people when they're reading these? Um, we are start. We have been talking about that, but we're really starting to focus on that now. So with each iteration, and we expect that there will be um, probably at least two iterations per fiscal year in terms of the operational plan because there are things that will be changing and that we'll be making adjustments to. Um, we've also talked about adding different components to the operational plan to be in line with good project management practices as appendices. So we'll be feeding those into the operational plan next year. Um, we have a rigorous change control process within the decennial census management team process and we'll be applying those, those same rigorous uh, requirements to changes to the operational plan. Okay, well, we're right on schedule, so I'd like to ask us now to move uh, to the presentation about the address validation test. Before Evan gets started, I would like to announce that we've asked the team to adjust the air conditioning. They made that adjustment about half an hour ago, so very shortly. I hope that you'll feel a change in terms of the coolness and the humidity in the room, so just be patient. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Evan Moffitt. Uh, Mike Radcliffe and Pat Cantwell and I will be sharing with you the results of the address validation test. So what you're going to hear today um, is uh, some general background on the address validation test as well as results of the statistical modeling component, which is uh, the math model validation test and results of the partial block canvas portion of this as well. <clears throat> the purpose of the address validation test is to evaluate our methods for re-engineering address canvassing. Um, in addition, um, we are testing how well our in-office procedures can replace in-field procedures and to assess our ability to ensure an accurate master address file moving forward. As you've heard in previous PMRs, there's a couple of components to the address validation test, the first of which is the math model validation test, the MMVT. Um, we collected data for this portion of AVT um, from September to December of 2014. Um, we use this to assess statistical models, which Pat is going to talk about in just a minute. This was a nationally represented sample, and we used our full block canvassing methodology, which we have uh, used traditionally um, in the census. We used a legacy piece of software to collect this data, and that was the automated listing and mapping instrument. The second component of the ABT, or the partial block canvassing test, was conducted between December of 14 and February of 15. Um, the purpose of this was to test the ability to canvas partial blocks as opposed to full blocks, which was done in the math model validation test. Um, these blocks were identified um, through the use of imagery, and we are uh, planning to apply this technology um, as we move forward with the address canvassing program for 2020. Um, from a data collection perspective, we used our next generation listing and mapping instrument uh, to collect this data. At this point, I'll turn it over to Pat. Thank you, Evan. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm going to give you just very brief background on the ma math model validation test. Uh, 
uh, many more details are available, but we spoke about this at one or two of the prior PMRs. Uh, we took a national sample of 10,100 blocks. Now the 10,000 blocks, we took 10,000 blocks, a sample from it, uh, of, of those with at least one address. So the, the, uh, in the United States, we have about 6.3 million blocks with at least one address. We took a representative sample of 10,000 of those. We also took a sample of 100 blocks. This was just a convenient sample to do a little further analysis uh, from those with no addresses. Our models for, for uh, blocks with no addresses are a bit different. So we're talking about, about 1 million addresses in our, sample part, uh, in our sample here. And we did a full block dependent canvassing. So by dependent, we mean that the listers started with uh, a list, an extract that we took, and they were to go to all these addresses, verify the addresses as they found them, update anything that they found out there, including adding addresses that weren't on the list that they were given, delete addresses that shouldn't be there, like that. So the two main research questions were, can we use statistical models to determine specific blocks that need additional action? Now this could be various uh, types of action, but mostly we, we put these together into the two types, in-office or in-field canvassing. And second, can we use these models to predict the, the coverage of the math, the quality of the math? Otherwise, how many ads, how many deletes, or other uh, errors are on the math? Well, before we give you any numbers, and let me just summarize briefly. The statistical models that we applied in this test were not effective in two major areas. First, identifying specific blocks with many ads or deletes. And second, predicting national totals of math coverage errors, otherwise the ads or deletes in our frame. Okay, so let's look at some numbers. I want to just give a little, back, a little information on this slide so that you understand it clearly. And let me start with the, left, the first column of numbers. Okay, so these are just totals. This, ha this deals with what's in the universe and what we conducted in the field. Otherwise, it has nothing to do with the models themselves. So we took uh, our universe, and we had about 10,000, we had 10,000 blocks in the universe. These are the uh, blocks with at least one address. Weighted up, you can see that they have about, there are about 6.3 million blocks these using the sample weights. And this gives us about 136.3 million addresses in our frame. As I said, we're talking about blocks with at least one address. As we've mentioned before, we also did not go to Alaska, Hawaii, and some of the federal lands. We also didn't include Puerto Rico in this test. Now, we went to each of these blocks in the sample, so we, can, uh, we did the field work in all of them. So across all of the 10,000 blocks in sample, we found weighted about 5.7 million ads, so that's the weighted number there, and about 7.6 million deletes through our field work. So let's look at the models themselves, or let's look at uh, the numbers that we're giving you for them. We have, I have here models one, two, three, and four. These are four specific different types of statistical approaches uh, in our models. And we've talked about these, I think, in two PMRs before, so I won't go into details about them. Uh, there's little information in one of the slides at the back of your package. Uh, and again, if you're interested, we can answer any questions. But we want to compare the performance of these models in trying to say which blocks need work right now or need some kind of action right now, whether that's in, in office canvassing, in field canvassing. So what they did is they took the, the list of blocks that we had in the sample, and based upon the models, they prioritized the blocks from those most, meetings, most needing some kind of action all the way down to those least needing action. Now, to make it a, somewhat, a, a fair comparison, we did a 20% canvas, where the 20% represents the number of addresses. As I mentioned before, we went to all of these addresses in the field, but the idea is, what if we, could have, what if we decided only to go to a certain number of them uh, in our canvas? So, for example, looking at model one, it went down the list of blocks that are most need of canvassing, and when it got, when it got down to about 47.3% of the blocks, it had its 20% of the housing units in our frame. And models two, three, and four did prioritize the blocks differently according to those models. You'll notice, for instance, 
Model 3 only selected 4.4% of the blocks for its canvas, even though it attained 20% of the housing units in the frame. And of course, I'm talking with weighted numbers here. So it actually, went, uh, Model 3 uh, selects large blocks in, uh, in its work. So let's look at the results down at the, the bottom two rows. For ads, what's the rate of capture of the ads in the universe based upon this 20%? 20% canvas. By the way, I mentioned 20%. There's nothing special about 20%. We could have done other, we uh, used other numbers. In, in our report, we have results for 20%, 25%, and 40%, and the results are analogous. Uh, so looking at the rate of capture of ads, we can see that models one, two, and four did just about, uh, performed about equally, 47% capture of the ads. Uh, for the deletes, uh, there was more uh, variety here, diversity here, 34%, Model 1, 53%, Model 2, which is not surprising, Model 2 is actually uh, built to try to capture deletes, even though it did uh, just as well as some of the others capturing ads. Uh, so we're doing better than random selection of, of uh, housing units or addresses, the 20%, but it's not as, as good as we had hoped. Let me look at this two different ways. I'm going to go to the next slide. On the next slide, we look instead of at address level results, how about block level results? Otherwise, what are the important blocks to capture? Obviously, if a block has no ads, no deletes, no, no errors in there, we would like not to spend money uh, on that block at the time. However, if it has 50 ads, that's certainly an ad, uh, certainly a block uh, that uh, deserves some kind of attention, some kind of work. Well, where's the threshold? Just for this exercise, we looked at blocks with at least five ads. Also, we looked at blocks with at least one ad. Um, so you can see again down the left, the first column of numbers. Again, the same number of blocks, this is the same uh, row here, number of blocks, 6.3 blocks weighted from the sample. And in the sample, we had 188,000, again a weighted number, of blocks with five or more ads. So you can see this is a relatively rare event. Only about 3% of the blocks did have five or more ads. And uh, how well did our models do capturing these? Well, again, the models one, two, and four captured about 43 to 47% of these blocks. Again, uh, much better than random, but, uh, but not what we would like. Uh, blocks with at least one ad, uh, model one actually got about 54% of them, and they varied across there. Uh, now let's look at the other side. The other side is how about the rate of blocks erroneously canvassed? You go out there and you find nothing out there, at least not what you were looking for. So if we consider blocks with five or more ads, if you considered an error if the block didn't have five or more ads, then our, all of our, uh, th three of our models were up around the 95% error rate. Model three did, did a bit better there. Even if you look at blocks with at least one ad, we had error rates around 75 or 67 percent, although only 33 percent for Model 3. So again, uh, some slightly positive results, but not up to what we're looking for. We'll look at this one more way uh, before we uh, move on to the second research question. Is Let's look at prediction versus observation. So here's a prediction outcome matrix. On the left-hand column, and I admit this is difficult to see, uh, in the left-hand column, we have the predictions, and this is based upon actually model one, which happened to be a zero-inflated negative binomial model, and we use the average of the predicted distribution, which is just one way you could, you could represent uh, a distribution. And so, for instance, the first row, don't go looking down the left-hand column, the first row says, suppose we're predicting between zero and one-quarter of an ad for a block. Otherwise, we're predicting that there's nothing out there in terms of ads. Uh, and what we've highlighted on the far uh, upper right corner so you can see, these are the blocks with five or more ads, although we've broken them down across there is what did we observe in the field, zero, one, two. The yellow represents five or more ads. So if you're looking at this first row, which what we're thinking of as least likely to need some action, according to our prediction, you can see that we're only missing five uh, blocks with five or more ads a very small proportion of the time, half a percent for that first row. And for the second row, again, only about half a percent. So these numbers are very small. Now, this is also not too surprising considering most blocks don't have any ads. 
So, uh, but what we have in the first four rows, which represented 75% of the blocks, these numbers are generally between half a percent and one and a half percent, where you'd find five or more ads. So, for the, uh, for the, low, uh, for the first so many rows, we're predicting very little to happen. Uh, very little is happening. However, we don't do so well when we're predicting larger amounts. When we're predicting large numbers, 10, or more, 10, or 10 to 20 ads, 20 to 50, or 50 or more, sure, we do see some results where we have a lot of ads, but we also see a lot of results where we have very few ads. And I also should mention that the standard errors become much larger in the, in the bottom rows. I, we have them in our report, not right here. But the standard errors become much larger because there are very few blocks for which we predicted so many ads. So uh, this, it says that this could be used as a screening procedure, perhaps, to help say these are the blocks that we don't want to pay attention to right now, and let's concentrate on the other set of blocks, the blocks down towards the bottom. But overall, the prediction was only, it only worked moderately well. So the second question asked about how well can we do predicting coverage uh, of the math, and otherwise errors in the math, adds and deletes are what we're focusing on here. So you can see the first row. This is just the first row of numbers is just the sample base estimates. This is just based on the field work. We have 135.9 million addresses. You might, if you happen to remember, this is a little different from what I had in a prior slide because the prior slide was a sample base number. This actually is the actual tally from the frame. They're about the same. But the, uh, the next uh, two rows are, are uh, estimates from the sample. In the field, we estimated 5.7 million ads. What would our model uh, have, have predicted? About 8.6 million, much higher. Uh, the deletes did a little better. We found in the field a weighted number 7.6 million ads, but our model predicted about 8.7, still very high. Now, I will say that this is, the models are based upon data from the 2009 address canvassing, and we applied it to data uh, that were available at the time of the test. So we're using old parameters. We wanted to see how well they would work, otherwise, based upon information that we already had available, because this will be the case. Going into address canvassing for, for further action or field action or whatever like this, we can only use the information that's already available across the country or across whatever domain we're talking about. So just to summarize, uh, determining the specific, the specific blocks that need additional action, the rate of capture was too low. The rate of erroneous canvas was too high. Using the statistical models to predict national totals, you can see that we overpredicted based upon the information that we used. The model parameters reflected the condition of the math back in 2009 from which the data were taken, the 2009 address canvassing for the 2010 census. I also want to say that right, the conditions are different in many other ways, not to mention like the economy, the state of the map itself. We're only halfway through the decade. Further, there have been many en enhancements and updates to the map because of our geographic support system initiative. So that has uh, improved the quality of the map and uh, made for fewer ads and deletes on the map. Okay, I'm gonna turn this over to Mike. Thank you, Pat. Uh, I'll talk about the partial block canvassing test and our results and a little bit about some of the analysis of the imagery review that formed a portion of the in-office work for partial block canvassing and how that related to MMVT listing results. Uh, so we went into the partial block canvassing. Well, I'll, I'll start with uh, Evan had mentioned uh, the partial block canvassing was a test of a new methodology uh, going to only a portion of the block as the name implies rather than the full block. I'll just reiterate, this was a new methodology or is a new methodology for the Census Bureau that we wanted to test. Uh, it involved testing our methods for identifying blocks that would be appropriate for partial block canvassing, but more importantly, testing our instructions to listers and other information that we provided to them to help them navigate in the field, find their work locations, define their work locations, and then carry out the work. Uh, We've talked about full block canvassing uh, already, but in that operation, the lister is, I, the, the canvasser receives a block that is their work area. They navigate to a starting point on the block, and then they traverse the entirety of the block, all the roads internal to the block, but they move around the block in a very organized fashion. With partial block canvassing, we're sending them, obviously, to only a portion of the block, and we need to describe to them 
how to get to that specific portion and do that in a way that they can find that, that work site and carry out their work effectively. Uh, so we went in with two assumptions that partial block canvassing would be more efficient in large land area blocks by avoiding the need to traverse the entirety of the block to collect changes. I've got an example that I'll show of a couple of large, relatively large suburban blocks. And then in blocks with large numbers of addresses that are, that are in the map and can be validated in the office, partial block canvassing would save time by focusing our efforts only on the portion of the block in which changes have occurred and that we have not accounted for in our update operations. Uh, so there were a number of research questions. The first three, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read through all of these, but the first three relate to the, uh, the methodology and the materials for carrying out partial block canvassing. And the last one uh, relates to, the fourth one relates to how effective our in-office methodology, specifically our imagery review, is at identifying where housing units have changed. And so the uh, math model validation test gave us the opportunity to collect information in the field that we could then use to test and, uh, and assess how well or how effective our, in -off our imagery review uh, was, and I'll have more information on that towards the, at the end of the presentation. As part of our analysis, we wanted to look at um, the results from field work in comparison to expectations based on our in-office review. Did we collect the information that we expected? Did we find additional updates in the field? Um, and in the um, and then in addition, for blocks that were in both the partial block and the full block canvassing, all of the partial block canvassing blocks were drawn from within the 10,100 sample for the math model validation test. So in those blocks, compare the results from both tests and assess the reasons for any differences. Uh, did the full block canvassers find additional updates, especially any that might not be detectable through imagery review? This was a real concern for us because as we're looking at the imagery and you can, you can see where change has occurred, and I have a couple of examples, and we'll see that in just a moment, but there are certain types of changes to housing units, particularly within existing structures where you can't see underneath the roof. In that sort of situation, the imagery review might not detect the change to housing units, but the listers would find those in the field. So we wanted to gather information about the extent of that and, and assess that and then uh, use that information to help hone our techniques for in-office work or look for other sources of information for those kinds of changes. So I've already mentioned uh, we drew our 615 uh, partial block canvassing blocks from within the 10,100 uh, MMBT blocks. Uh, we had 37 assignment areas. We grouped the blocks into assignment areas, uh, 37 different areas, um, 35 listers went out into the field. These were all professionals. Given the timing, uh, of the development of the, 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 pro the, the program. We really didn't have time to hire staff, so we used professional staff from headquarters and the regional offices to carry out the work. This also gave us an opportunity for the professional staff who were working on programs and developing procedures and methods to actually test them in the field and gain that critical experience. And Evan has mentioned we used the uh, corporate uh, listing and mapping application. This was the first use of the Lima in a production operation in the field. So let's look at a couple of uh, examples of imagery. Uh, here we can see a typical suburban block. Um, uh, the older image in both of these instances, the, well, in this case, the older image is on the left, the newer image is on the right. Uh, you can see in the older image where there are, there are, there's undeveloped land. Um, we can confirm, the, and then in the newer image, you can see that there have been houses built on those parcels, on, on that land. We can confirm in the office, comparing to the master address file, the number of counts, and then we can confirm the addresses. So we confirm that the houses that you see in the older image are accounted for in the master address file, and then we have new houses that we have to, new addresses that we have to collect and then add to the master address file. So here we would send the lister only to the portions of those streets where the changes have actually occurred and where we need to collect new information. And this image, and I'll, I'll just mention that this image is also on a poster that we have out in the hallway that discusses uh, uh, partial block canvassing. So you can look at that poster 
uh, during the break and at your leisure. Uh, but in this image, this is uh, several blocks in Anne Arundel County. Uh, the blue, uh, the block boundaries are highlighted in blue. Uh, you've got the full extent of two blocks or several blocks on the left, and then on the right, the older image on top and the newer image, the more current image on the bottom. Uh, these two blocks together uh, encompass seven road miles. So if we did, a, if we conducted a full block canvas in these blocks, the listers, the canvassers would have to drive a total of seven miles to conduct or walk a total of seven miles to carry out their work. Uh, we can confirm that for most of the block, we already have accounted, or most of each of these blocks, we've already accounted for the addresses within the master address file, and the area where change has actually occurred is circled in red. In the left, we've got one circle, and then you can see the two specific cul-de-sacs where changes have occurred circled in the images on the right. There's uh, 1,100, a little over 1,100 houses uh, that are already in, that are in these blocks that are already accounted for in the master address file, and the change on these two new cul-de-sacs accounts for 20 additional houses. So again, if we canvassed the entirety of these blocks, the canvasser would be validating the existence of, validating the records for, uh, for 1,100 housing units, and then adding 20. In the partial block approach, they go directly to the area where change has occurred. We validated the other addresses in the office, and they go to, directly to the location of the change, collect the information for the 20 new addresses, complete their work, and then move on to their next assignment. So getting to some results. Uh, our analysis of the partial block canvassing results indicates that we can successfully implement this methodology in the field. Um, all listers navigated to their specific work assignments based on the written descriptions from the in-office imagery reviewers. We do need to conduct additional analysis to determine the specific contexts in which partial block canvassing is most effective and most efficient, as well as the level of expertise and experience that it's, that's necessary for listers. Again, recall that I said we, we had 35 professionals, those were mostly geographers that went out into the field. Um, we need to test this with our typical listing and canvassing staff to understand if there are specific training and experience and levels of expertise that are needed to carry out this type of canvassing more effectively or to carry it out effectively. Um, with regard to uh, the successful navigation, we, while all canvassers, all listers did reach their work assignments and they were area able to carry out work, there were some instances in which instructions from the in-office reviewers uh, were confusing uh, were, or were unclear, and those affected their ability to carry out work effectively and accurately. So we've identified those, kind, those specific situations, and we're looking at how we can better describe the work, better identify the specific work sites so that, we, so that it's clear to the lister the exact work that they need to carry out. And the work area polygons that we defined, so in each work assignment we gave them a written instruction, you'll see some instructions on the next slide, uh, but we also drew a polygon around the area where they were supposed to work. We gave them a boundary. And in some instances, the work area polygon that was defined based on the, Im the imagery review in the office, um, based on the new development that was visible in imagery, did not always match the extent of new development on the ground. So in other words, we were looking at the best imagery, the most current imagery we had. We drew the boundary around what we thought was the area of change, and when the canvasser got to that area, there was additional development. The, the development was larger, the extent of the area was larger than we expected based on the imagery. They were told to work uh, based off of the written instructions and continue on, keep, to continue uh, adding, uh, carrying out their work, but in some cases, they stopped work at the boundary of their work polygon. And that accounted for some of the differences that we saw between the full block canvassing and the partial block canvassing. Uh, here, are some, here are the different instruction types. Um, I, you can read these, but uh, just uh, a, a couple in, in general. Most of the work assignments were uh, either whole streets or you know, canvas the entirety of Johnson Court. That's fairly clear. Canvas Burke Street from 46 to 50. 
um, inclusive, uh, inclusive of those two addresses. It's the branching roads instruction that was the one that caused more confusion than others, where Canvas starting at the intersection of Freedom Highway and Redwood Drive, Canvas Redwood Drive, and any roads that branch off of Redwood Drive. This is the specific situation where, uh, the, where we saw the difference between the instruction, between the polygon that was defined based on imagery, and then what the lister found actually in the field. And then where you had multiple roads branching off of that trunk line running into the, the development. In some cases, they only listed the, the initial branch going off of the main road, uh, in other case, although, you know, as opposed to continuing on to every street that continued off of. So if you imagine the tree, all of the branches, then the twigs, and so on, that continue off. So those are the areas where we need to refine our instructions, refine our, our information uh, so that we avoid those, so that sort of confusion. All right, going to specific results. Well, in uh, the partial block canvassing blocks, we had a total of 17,627 actions that were taken, and the vast majority of those, or the majority of those, were ads, which is what we were expected. We were going out to focus on change, and uh, so we expected that most of the action taken in the field would be new addresses collected. Um, those broke down, those 10,189 uh, ads broke down into what we call true ads. These are addresses that were completely new to the MAF. So Pat mentioned uh, going out into the field with a list, just like MMBT, the partial block canvassing went out with a dependent list, a list of addresses uh, loaded onto the Lima. Um, so 4,300 of the addresses that were added were completely new to the MAF. 2,900, 2,931 of those addresses were in the master address file but had not been geocoded. So we collected information that allowed us to geocode to the block 2,900 addresses. So that's good. That's making the math more accurate, uh, uh, improving the quality of the master address file. And then 2,957 of those ads were ads that match to the MAF, but they were other kinds of addresses. So there, there are filtering rules that we apply to decide what types of addresses make it onto the list. Uh, some of these, most of these addresses were addresses that did not make it onto the list, but were already in the master address file. Um, so we need to look at how we, uh, how we structure, how we uh, identify what is a good address to go onto a list for canvassing. Uh, so we'll be looking at those 2,900 addresses to see what can we learn about their characteristics. Uh, we had a number of deletes, duplicates, changes, uh, only two changed uh, to non-residential, and, and so on. And we verified 7,000 addresses. And again, those were mostly the addresses that were bounding the work assignments. Compared to the math model validation test, um, we see similar, roughly similar numbers of, of action or of ads um, uh, acquired. Um, we do have more ads in partial block canvassing than we had in the math model validation test. We need to look at those, those differences more, um, uh, in more detail, but partial block canvassing went into the field later than ma the math model validation test. Uh, in some cases, the partial block canvassers were in the field up to, in, the, in their block, up to three months after the math model validation test lister had visited that same block. And there were blocks, I was in a number of blocks where there was active construction occurring. So we expect that a, lo a number of the, uh, the some, uh, some of the difference between the number of ads in partial block canvassing compared to MMBT is simply because we were in the field later and we're picking up housing units that were built in that interim period after the MMBT lister was there. Um, as we expected, uh, Ad actions accounted for a higher percentage, a much higher percentage of total actions in partial block canvassing than in math model validation test, but that's because they were, the actions by the MMVT listers included large numbers of verifications and validations, things that we were doing in the office for partial block canvassing. Uh, so some of our key takeaways, uh, in relating in this slide, relating to when partial block canvassing did not find an address that was located by math model validation test, reasons for the omissions tended to be the area was provided to the PBC lister, but the instruction was poorly worded or the polygon was poorly defined, I've mentioned that already, uh, leading to lister confusion. 
The ad represented a situation that was not detectable by imagery review, uh, changes within existing structures, uh, or changes in the use of an existing structure. So we had instances where there were additional apartments found within an existing apartment building, uh, but we also have instances where, and we know that this is an issue for imagery review, where you have conversion from commercial to residential use. So you're looking at the rooftop, you see the structure in both sets of images, but you don't know that the change has occurred uh, underneath the roof. Um, so in those situations, the, the changes were not provided as a work area. And then the third emission, uh, the ad represented a situation that was not detected due to imagery quality or vintage issues, and therefore also was not provided to the lister. And we're looking at those. Um, and as part of our work in geography division, we'll be acquiring higher quality, higher resolution imagery to deal with some of these issues. Uh, especially related to areas where you have a dense canopy in the image and it obscures uh, the, the, the ability to see images on uh, structures on the ground. Additional key takeaways, well I've talked about this, some of this already, polygon instructions uh, resulted in, uh, they, tend, they generally resulted in successful navigation, but we have learned the, uh, and are looking at the areas where we had problems and uh, developing uh, refinements to those instructions. The one recommendation we also, and coming back from our, our listers and our debriefing sessions, they all agreed that clearing up and um, fixing missing and misaligned street features and block boundaries in the office prior to uh, sending out to the field would help uh, improve the process of, of canvassing and improve the process in the field. So get the feature. and. So improve the quality of the road network, improve the accuracy and the, the locational information for the roads before going out into the field. Uh, so based on the PBC test, we recommend um, uh, that we, we test the partial block canvassing in the 2016 address canvassing test with traditional listers, uh, that we improve the, written clar the clarity of written instructions, and that we conduct additional analysis on the individual, at the individual address level to fully understand the differences between the math model validation test and the PBC listing results and the imagery review results. Right, we're running out of time, so I'm going to move quickly into some of our, uh, some of our results, uh, comparing imagery with the math model validation test. Uh, so we were interested in, in uh, so the math model val validation test gave us the opportunity to, um, and through our in-office portion of the P PBC, gave us the opportunity to compare imagery and test that and assess that aspect of the work. Um, 70%, so we're looking at the, uh, the 18,000 ad actions taken in math model validation test. 12,900 of those were detected through imagery review. Um, and we had 1,168 1, that were detectable. They were uh, theoretically detectable by imagery, but were missed due to imagery quality, in the review process issues, uh, or reviewer errors. A um, little under 1,000 were detectable by imagery but was missed due to the vintage, so uh, I can go into more of that later, um, some of the vintage issues. And then 2,600 were undetectable by imagery. These were, again, within structure changes. So we have to look for other sources of information about change for those types of units. See, I'm not advancing here. Or did I advance? Must have hit the wrong. Well, so the next slide is uh, while we're waiting for that. Uh, oops. One more. Yeah. I'm yeah. Anyway, so the next slide, uh, we looked at the, um, we compared imagery review results against the observed number of MMVT ads, the weighted results for the nation. Yeah, that's it. We're on slide 28. If you go one more. Okay, there we go. 
Uh, so this was looking at um, the, what we expected when we uh, reviewed the imagery compared to the observed number of ads uh, in the MMBT. And the highlighted cells here, in 82% of the blocks in which the imagery review expected to find zero ads, the MMVT listers also found zero ads. So that tells us, uh, again, the imagery review is very good at, at identifying consistency, stability, uh, where there's been no change. And in an additional 11% of blocks where we, we expected to find zero ads based on the imagery, the MMVT listers found only one. So that's encouraging news about the, uh, related to imagery review in the in-office work. At the other end of the scale, uh, only in 65% of the blocks in which we expected to find more than 21 ads based on the imagery, the MMVT lister also found more than 21. Uh, so again, that goes back to uh, some of the issues with, uh, within structure change, apartment buildings, and so on. Looking at this a little bit more, uh, so we're, as part of our in-office canvassing work, we're identifying blocks that we would identify as passive where there's been no change or where we've accounted for everything within the MAF already, so we would not need to take any action to, to update the address list. 84% uh, of the blocks with at least one address are stable, and, 80, and those blocks contain 85% of the addresses. Again, these are weighted results from the MMVT work and the imagery review. So the passive blocks, the blocks that we can review and say, these look good, we don't need to take any effective action immediately, uh, contain 85% of the housing units of the country. Fifth, the blocks where we would need to take action, where we're seeing differences between the MAF and what's on the ground, encompass about 15% of the housing units. And then the next step would be to identify the appropriate action to take, uh, acquire the update, to acquire updates to the address list. And Evan, do you want to take the last yeah, one? So you've heard a lot of information, and um, I just want to quickly summarize um, some key takeaways from this work um, as it relates to the objectives of the address validation test. Um, as you can see here, uh, the first objective was to evaluate our methods for re-engineering address canvassing. Um, from a statistical modeling perspective, uh, we believe that the models were not effective at identifying specific blocks with many ads or many deletes, um, nor at predicting national totals of MAF coverage errors. Um, <clears throat> as Mike just discussed, uh, we also believe that the partial block canvassing methodology offers potential um, savings, um, actually not savings, potential, a, a new methodology for um, conducting infield canvassing. And from a cost perspective, we plan to test um, partial block canvassing and full block canvassing to collect those metrics as part of the 2016 um, address canvassing test. The second objective that uh, was presented earlier was um, how well the in-office procedures can replace infield procedures. Um, we believe that we've demonstrated the utility of imagery review to guide decision making and um, inform the planning efforts for address canvassing. Um, we also believe that we demonstrated the value of field work to gather information to assess the effectiveness of uh, in-office methods. So uh, we plan to continue this work as part of the MAF coverage study, which will begin uh, next fiscal year. And then finally, um, one of our objectives was to assess our ability to ensure an accurate master address file. And our key takeaways here are that the MAF models were ineffective at measuring MAF coverage error. And we, can, we plan to um, continue to research um, this and focus on collecting metrics via the MAF coverage study in the future years ahead. So at this point, we want to take some questions. Yes, thanks for the uh, discussion on the uh, efforts to figure out how to do targeted address canvassing, which has been discussed over many of our reports and so on. So I appreciate these, uh, what you're telling us about what you've been testing and, and so on in such detail. Okay, uh, I asked a question earlier, Deirdre, about um, 
you know, the metrics, the quality metrics, and I've heard kind of like a lot of numbers and that it wasn't as good as we thought it would be or it, uh, I'm not, but I don't hear a lot of um, like definitive. Um, so if you have definitive, like what is many, what is uh, not as much as you had hoped for? What did you hope for? Actually, I don't think we've ever determined some specific number of ads or deletes that missing would be uh, okay. I mean, all of this depends upon what, what's going on in several areas. Uh, we have in-office canvassing and in-field canvassing, and both of them are gonna contribute towards the work. So if, for instance, if statistical models are trying to uh, predict where the ads are or which blocks have the ads, but if those can be picked up in a different uh, operation, and we haven't even defined all the operations or the sources that we're going to be using, uh, then it's, uh, let's just say that we haven't de decided what would, what would be an appropriate number right now, because it just depends too much on the different uh, sources and activities we'll be doing. Uh, right, so th there's no target uh, quality metric at this time. We haven't determined, we, we have not said this is a specific threshold that's acceptable and unacceptable, no. Oh, okay. Tricia, I think the key point that we wanted to get across was that going into the math model validation test, we were hopeful that statistical models could help us predict where we should do in-field address canvassing. And what happened was that we found out we should not do that, that we should rely on other mm -hmm. methods such as the use of imagery. That did prove very effective as part of the partial block canvassing test that we should continue our research with administrative records from federal, state, local governments, and really explore what the commercial sector has to offer in terms of the address and the geospatial data sets, and also really up-to-date imagery. And, and I think also it's not really, in my mind, it's not really a question of what is the expected number of ads and the expected number of deletes, but what is the, what is the number of housing units and addresses that exist and and you need to glean that from a variety of different sources that provide that information and then how well do we compare to that and then that identifies where we need to collect ads and where we need where we have too many addresses in the master address file and where we need to uh, collect updates to the master address file so population division is preparing a projected number of housing units for 2020 that will give us one measure to compare against as we look at a variety of other sources, commercial data files, administrative records, uh, the delivery sequence file from the Postal Service, local government files, all of these give us a sense of the number of housing units, the number of addresses that exist, and all can be used to compare against the master address file at a very detailed level to tell us how accurate we are in one location and how far off we may be in another location. And then what we need to do to bring those numbers into consistency. We'll take one more question from Ty and then we'll go to our break. Thank you. Ditto, Tricia, on how valuable all this information is. I, I'm not a modeling wonk on this stuff, but I've, I've always thought models were good in some situations better than other situations. And I'm hearing that they didn't work nationally, or they didn't work when you line them up straight up against the, um, the imagery. But does the Bureau know where the models worked well and where they didn't work well? They just seem to be a very relatively inexpensive way to find things if there are certain blocks with a priori. I mean, you have to know in advance where, you know, because I'm, think, I'm thinking like toolkit. I mean, the Bureau has all these different things it's doing and it, maybe it works in mean, urban areas as opposed to other areas. I mean, PBC didn't work in some places, but maybe, uh, you know, models worked better there. I mean, has that been explored? Actually, Ty, what you're saying is it refers to some of the work that we're doing right now. We're, we're looking at domains that uh, we can break the universe down into because they have, we have the data now following the test. So we're looking at the different areas, uh, breaking them into several, as you say, inner city balance, uh, more rural like that, and also looking even at the what we call ACT codes. I apologize, but I don't know what it stands for, but it represents the different types of enumeration that we would do. Address characteristic, Address characteristic types. Uh, but in any case, yes, we are looking at, uh, looking at uh, subdomains to see how well the models work on different subdomains. 
Okay, great, thank you. Thanks for your attention this morning. Uh, we are five minutes behind schedule, but I would like to offer the full 15 minutes for the break. So let's come back at 10 of 11. And I'd just like to add one thing. Um, Pat had to give his presentation to me twice in order for it to fully make sense. So if you have adi uh, additional questions for him during the break, I'm sure he would entertain those. Thank you. <laughs>